Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for um, another exciting Temple Beth Shalom program. Uh, we're really excited to present uh, a trip to Cuba this evening. Uh, you will uh, have the benefit of the of a presentation from somebody who uh, has been spent the last decade or more uh, visiting and um, understanding Cuba and working in Cuba. And we are really excited to be working with uh, David and Liza Lee from Cultural Cuba, who will be uh, bringing us tonight's presentation. And uh, we will talk more about uh, the potential for a TBS trip to Cuba towards the end of the, perform uh, the presentation. Please keep your um, selves muted. And if you have questions, please put them in the question box. Um, and then we will have an opportunity for some uh, back and forth and unmuting and muting. But if we have multiple people talking at the same time, it doesn't work. So uh, we will try to do that. David likes the, the ability to talk to people as opposed to the chat box. So we'll try to do that um, and gave, uh, give everybody as uh, deep an understanding um, of Cuba as possible and Jewish Cuba at that. So without further ado, David Lee. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, first, shalom, everyone. I, I guess it's more appropriate for me to say hola, but um, it's, uh, let me say, it's just really, uh, really nice for me to see so many of you interested in, in learning more about travel to Cuba, uh, especially today. You know, when, uh, I, I, as Mark said, I have been at this for, for uh, just about a decade. Um, and, uh, as probably you know, uh, under the Obama administration, you know, travel to Cuba became the, the really hot ticket. Um, in fact, it was on the top of almost every list um, as one of the most uh, in-demand places to travel to, not just for Americans, actually. And so we as a company experienced exponential growth during those years. Interestingly enough, even during the uh, former administration now, um, despite their best attempts, we still had had the demand didn't, didn't decrease and, and uh, neither did, did the amount of people really traveling to Cuba for the most part. Um, so we still experienced a lot of growth. However, we can't beat COVID. Um, the politics didn't stop us, but, but COVID certainly stopped all travel in its tracks and Cuba was no exception. Um, so before I, I, I get even further on, and I'm gonna share my screen with you, um, maybe you're wondering at this point why this uh, Ashkenazi Jew from Chicago, currently I live in Florida, uh, is, is, has become a Cuba expert. So um, just wanna, wanna share that, uh, a little bit of, of how I got there. Um, and like, uh, like you might expect, um, my story starts in Budapest, Hungary. Just that's where all Cuba experts come from. Um, but, but actually, I, uh, this is the truth. I was um, living in Central Europe, uh, not in the travel industry. Um, I, was, uh, I, I had a uh, telecom business there. And uh, if anyone has ever tried to uh, run their own business in an emerging market, uh, it's a wonderful experience, but it also comes with an extreme amount of anxiety. Um, so that led to, to uh, you know, a couple of vices, but the one I'm gonna share with you here is Cuban cigars. I, I, uh, I developed the taste for Cuban cigars while, while in Budapest, because unlike the US, that they're completely legal and widely distributed. And uh, once this became a, a serious you know, cigar addiction, probably better for me to call, let, let's use the word aficionado. That's, that sounds much nicer than a cigar addict. Um, I realized, uh, something that, um, it's not, there's a lot of truth. Let's put it this way to the fact that Cuban cigars are the best in the world. Um, maybe the, if, for those who, who smoke them, they probably know this already. Um, for those who don't, the, let me, let me see if I can give an analogy. Um, Comparing a Cuban cigar, I suppose, to, to cigar, other cigars from any other country, it's kind of like, uh, you know, having a, uh, a true bagel from Kosar's in New York City uh, versus, you know, getting a frozen lenders at Publix. Uh, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So again, let me, let me move forward. 
starts with cigars. Cigars led to Cuban rum. I can say the same analogy about Cuban rum. If you haven't had it, there, it will be the end of you know at you drinking any other rum from anywhere else. Um, that led to Cuban jazz, led to salsa, uh, led to me just taking a deep dive into the history of Cuba, Cuba-U.S. relations. Before I knew it, honestly, I was I was basically a Cuba file without ever having set foot on the island. So. Um, I, I can talk about, but if you haven't figured this out already, I can talk about Cuba for a long, long time. I know we don't have three hours tonight, so I'll, I'll try to move this forward because I haven't even started the actual presentation yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, long story short, sold my business, moved back to the U.S. Uh, I guess too young um, and too stupid to just simply retire. I was looking for something else to do. I was invited by a friend to uh, travel to Cuba on a, what was entitled a humanitarian mission. And it was mainly a group of doctors. They were bringing pharmaceutical supplies to Cuba. Of course that, you know, you didn't have to twist my arm. Cuba was gonna be somewhere I was headed no matter what. But what I discovered, uh, a couple of things. The main one was we didn't travel from Canada or Mexico. We flew on a chartered plane direct from Miami. Uh, on a completely legal treasury sanctioned trip. Uh, just as an aside, one thing that was interesting as I looked at my documents, expecting to see like on my travel affidavit, humanitarian, it actually said, you know, Jewish Cuba tour. Um, that wasn't what, what it was billed as. And the other, I guess, ironic part of the whole thing was that uh, not only was it not a, a Jewish tour, um, I was actually, I think, the only Jewish guy on the entire trip, which also is kind of interesting when you think that uh, it was mainly a group of doctors. I, I can't explain any of this, um, except for the fact that we got to Cuba. Um, we, we did see actually one, one synagogue, and, and some of the, the non-Jews on the trip thought that might have been one of the highlights. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I had very high expectations going in, right? I, like I said, I was, you know, already a Cubophile and it exceeded every expectation I had. I was just completely blown away by the experience. The thing that I knew upon returning after those uh, four and a half days was that I needed to go back. I wanted to bring friends and family back. And so I started to look at what was out there. How can I do this trip? This was a legal trip. My interest was not in flying in from another country. Um, I wanted to do something similarly. And while there were some companies that were doing travel to Cuba, again, this is a decade ago, uh, none of them travel like I want to travel, which is custom and private. Uh, I, I wanted off the beaten path. I didn't want to be on the so-called big bus tour, you know, where I, I'm on a fixed cookie cutter itinerary. So much of what I enjoyed about Cuba had to do with the people that I met, the deep dive into the culture. Um, and I realized I just couldn't find anything like that out there. So uh, I finally decided I'll just, I'm just going to start doing my own trips. And, you know, uh, how hard could it be? Um, again, short, long story short, one and a half years later, so, uh, Cultural Cuba was born. So it wasn't that easy. Nothing worthwhile usually is, um, but okay, enough about that. I'm gonna share my screen with you now and we'll get into the, to the heart of, of this presentation. Okay, hopefully my screen share is working. You should see some classic cars on the top there and, the, and what arguably is the most beautiful building in all of uh, Havana, the uh, Alicia Alonso Theater, uh, my logo, Sarasota Temple, Beth Sholem. So a little bit uh, about how this is gonna work. Um, and unfortunately, you weren't, you're not gonna see me as I'm talking through this. This is one of the, uh, the nuances of, of doing this through an iPad. Um, for some reason, the little box in the corner where usually you'd see me talking, it doesn't, doesn't pop up. But um, so 
through this presentation, you know, I'm going to give you a little back, a little more background on, on the company. We're certainly going to talk then a, a lot more about Jewish Cuba. But in order to really give you a sense, of course, we've got to go beyond Jewish Cuba. And when you travel with us, whether it's a Jewish themed trip or not, um, let's just say the Jewish sites and experiences would represent maybe 25, 30% of, of the trip. Um, there are so many amazing things. And to give you the true experience, you've got to go, obviously, and see and do and hear and feel so much more um, than those Jewish experiences. So we're going to talk about, about some of those as well um, when we finish the Jewish part. And um, we'll, we'll talk uh, a little bit more in general about what's necessary to, to uh, you know, put together these kinds of custom trips and end with you know, some detail about the proposed trip for all of you, uh, a very special trip that we're hoping to do uh, early um, next year. So, and then, uh, and then my favorite part, as Mark already mentioned, we're gonna finish with, with a Q&A if I can get through this thing quick enough, um, because that is what I really wanna do is I wanna hear from you. I love, you know, there's no question that's, that's off limits, out of bounds, whether it's about the trip or life in Cuba or anything, um, I, like I said, I can talk about it as long as anyone's willing to ask questions. So here we go. Why Cuba? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest my voice for a minute and just uh, play a little intro video for you. Cuba, not only a place frozen in time, but one where culture thrives every single day. Although located in the Caribbean, it is unlike any Caribbean island you have ever been to before. Yes, it has beautiful white sand beaches, but it also has cities like Havana with buildings dating back hundreds of years, a variety of architecture that compares with the greatest cities of Europe, more 1950s American classic automobiles than anywhere else, a creative organic cuisine that is undergoing an evolution due to the inception of the Polidars, private restaurants created in people's homes. It has the world's finest cigars and rum, and a history that can be literally experienced as a living museum. With the highest literacy rate and the lowest violent crime rate, it is also one of the safest places you can travel today. Plus, it now boasts true five-star hotels and gorgeous renovated boutique mansions. But what really sets it apart is the talent warmth and energy of its people. The preponderance of world-class artists, musicians, and dancers as a percentage of the population is greater than any country on earth. For over nine years, we have been developing our team of world-class bilingual guides to bring you deep into the culture that is at the heart of this magnificent island. All we do is private custom tours. We cultivate our itineraries to match your interests and style of travel and create not just a trip, but an adventure that will literally change the way you view the world and leave you with memories that last a lifetime. Call us at Cultural Cuba today. Okay. Everyone hear me? I just want to make sure the sound's still transferred. Um, so a little bit more, that was just a, a general overview. And of course, we'll get into a, a little more specifics. Um, but to explain just quickly about us, um, in the travel industry lingo, we're, we're, we're referred to as what's called a destination management company. Um, if you're not in the travel industry, you know, that, that doesn't mean much. But the end of the day, what we are, we are a company with uh, quote unquote boots on the ground in the destination that we provide service for. We do not outsource. Therefore, um, our we, we handle everything soup to nuts from the, um, the beginning, you know, design of an itinerary to the visas for the travel. Um, but probably most importantly, you know, our team on the ground, our headquarters of our operations is in Havana itself. They are our guides. They are our drivers, vehicles, you know, concierge staff. We do not outsource to the Cuban government. 
In fact, the reality is the only thing that we outsource to the Cuban government because we have no other choice is if uh, is certain sizes of buses because we can't actually own them. Um, the export regulations prohibit it, and it's just you don't you don't no one owns those on a, on a private basis. But this becomes important actually when we get into a little bit more about the um, legalities of travel to Cuba as an American. The fact that we don't outsource anything. Uh, but from from that, besides that perspective, the main thing from our for, for us is is control, control of the quality, and it, the most important part of of everything, as far as that's concerned, is the guides themselves. And I will talk a little bit more about that before we get into Jewish Cuba. Um, the thing about guides and the way we approach guides, they are not. Uh, someone who is just talking to you from a you know outside of a bus pointing at statues and saying dates the idea for us and all of our guides local cuban they are highly educated obviously extremely fluent in english um, it's about their you know their, they have this deep sense of pride for their culture and they act more like you are visiting a local friend in the destination and that local friend or family member wants to show you their culture. They want to introduce you to their friends, their family. They want to take you off the beaten tourist path. Not completely, because some tourist you know, sites are important. Uh, that's why they're, they're tourist sites. But the, the concept of this is, you know, these people are literally, they, they love their culture. They're also curious about you. And so it's, it's a certain sensibility that I think a lot of people have not really experienced, you know, and I hadn't until I, you know, when I traveled around and had guided experiences and I recognized what, what sets it apart. And so the guide is probably the single most important part of, of any trip that we do. And the wonderful thing about the Cuban people, uh, for the most part, they are incredibly literal. It, it is the high, they have the highest literacy rate of almost any country. Um, in the in the world, they're very. It doesn't matter what, what what their job is, what walk of life. They're very interested in current events. They're interested in other countries, people from different cultures, um, and it's this sensibility that you wouldn't necessarily expect given their history um, that just makes them so warm and so inviting. So, um, let's move on to Jewish Cuba. The uh, and I'm not going to get too deep into the history of this, or we definitely will will be here all night. Um, but you know, the there there was uh, I guess it dates back to uh, late 19th century um, was when the really first permanent Jewish community was established. Um, primarily, uh, you know, there were there were actually some American Ashkenazi Jews that settled you know, in Cuba after the Spanish-American War. Um, and then of course it primarily were, was Sephardic Jews that began to, to settle there and form a community. Um, now the community thrived and grew up until the revolution. And at that point, I think it was, there was probably the, the community was about, I think 15, 16,000 strong, 90% of them left. Most of them went to the US, but this is obviously what really decimated, you know, the Jewish community and the population. Probably not a surprise to any of you. Um, and now, since then, slowly, I mean, it's been 60 years, there's been a revival. And that's why I would say the recent estimate, as it shows on this slide right at this point, um, is that there is approximately 1,200 Jews. Again, the majority reside in Havana, but of course that's also not surprising. That's where the uh, most of the synagogues are. Also in general, uh, if you look at Cuba, um, you know, 50% of the total population of the island would also reside in Havana. Okay, so I'm going to now, I have to, uh, just for technical reasons, but this next video, which is very um, hot off the presses, so to speak, uh, which I have uh, our, probably our preeminent, um, certainly Jewish guide. Um, and by the way, he's gonna, so you will see him on screen. He's gonna walk you through Jewish Cuba today. This, this was filmed actually just, just the last, you know, six, about six weeks ago when they started, started production on it. Uh, so you will see 
a very quiet Cuba that normally you would never see. This is COVID, you know, post-COVID Cuba, very empty streets, not a lot of traffic. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to, aside from a couple of photos from, the, from before, we're not going to be able to take you inside any, any of the synagogues on this particular video, because right now they are all closed. Um, but again, you'll, you'll get a chance to, uh, to meet our, one of our top guides. And although he actually is not Jewish, so it always surprises me because I, I think I've, I haven't met anyone yet that speaks more Yiddish than he does. Um, he got his visa to travel back and forth to the United States, which is, is very hard to get and uh, something every Cuban, almost every Cuban would like to have. Uh, is a multiple entry visa. He tr he struggled for years to get it. The way he finally got it, it was actually with the support of the Yiddish Book Center in New York. They brought him in as a speaker and through some political connections got him his his uh, his visa. So when I say he's just an amazing he's an amazing guide all uh, all the way around. When I tell you that you know nobody knows Jewish Cuba like like he does, uh, I, I I promise you um, it's an accurate statement. All right, here we go. Let's help this place. Adath Israel is the only nominally Orthodox synagogue in Cuba. Situated in Old Havana, the building opens its doors every day for services and accommodates 40 to 50 congregants. It is the only synagogue with a mikvah and its spiritual leader, and Shochet, is also responsible of the kosher butcher shop in the same neighborhood. Sephardic Jews from Turkey and Syria emigrated to Cuba fleeing the Balkan Wars and established their own community in the years preceding World War I. The Sephardic Hebrew Center in Havana is the only remaining institutional legacy of the Sephardic presence in Cuba. The Sephardic community represents today approximately 60% of the Cuban Jewish population spreading to the middle and eastern part of Cuba. The building was built in the 1950s when the community moved from the Old Havana area where its first synagogue had become unsound. Members of the United Hebrew Congregation, the first Hebrew society established in Cuba, bought land in the town of Guanabacoa for the first Jewish cemetery in the island. The cemetery, containing more than 1,000 grave sites, has recently received upkeeping and restoration from the office of the lay city historian, Eusebio Leal. The cemetery also has a 10-foot monument paying tribute to the 6 million Jews who died in the Holocaust. This is considered the first Holocaust memorial in the Western Hemisphere.
It is with great sorrow that I stand here in front of the Patronato, epicenter of Jewish life in Cuba, and see these iron gates closed. No visitors or members allowed since the pandemic hit Cuba in March of last year. Regular congregants that have made this place their second home, average 60 years or more, would be too exposed and vulnerable to infection. In light of the current situation with the coronavirus, the Jewish community has decided to interrupt Jewish life for over a year now. Adap Israel is the only nominally Orthodox synagogue in Cuba. Situated in Old Havana, the building opens its doors every day for services and accommodates 40 to 50 congregants. It is the only synagogue with a mikvah, and its spiritual leader, a shofet, is also responsible of the kosher butcher shop in the same neighborhood. Sephardic Jews from Turkey and Syria immigrated to Cuba fleeing the Balkan Wars and established their own community in the years preceding World War I. The Sephardic Hebrew Center in Havana is the only remaining institutional legacy of the Sephardic presence in Cuba. The Sephardic community represents today approximately 60% of the Cuban Jewish population spreading to the middle and eastern part of Cuba. Their building was built in the 1950s when the community moved from the old Havana area where its first synagogue had become unsound. Members of the United Hebrew Congregation, the first Hebrew society established in Cuba, bought land in the town of Guanabacoa for the first Jewish cemetery in the island. The cemetery containing more than 1,000 grave sites has recently received upkeeping and restoration from the office of the main city historian, Eusebio Leal. The cemetery also has a 10-foot monument paying tribute to the 6 million Jews who died in the Holocaust. This is considered the first Holocaust memorial in the Western Hemisphere. It is with great sorrow that I stand here in front of the Patronato, epicenter of Jewish life in Cuba, and see these iron gates closed. No visitors or members allowed since the pandemic hit Cuba in March of last year. Regular congregants that have made this place their second home, average 60 years or more, would be too exposed and vulnerable to infection. In light of the current situation with the coronavirus, the Jewish community has decided to interrupt Jewish life for over a year now.
Okay. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to uh, share my, go back to sharing my screen now. Um, it's, uh, it, it, I know it ended with a little doom and gloom. It's a, it's a little bit like a, a, a Yom Kippur appeal. Um, I, I let my, my team, uh, you know, use their creative, uh, and, and, and this is a little bit of how they're feeling right now to be, to be quite honest. Um, but I, I will, I will say that there's no question, um, COVID has been a, a, a difficult situation for everyone, for the entire world. Um, but Cuba really depends uh, greatly on tourism and having this kind of shutdown is, a, is, is quite devastating. So um, they are quite uh, eager to, it's not just Jewish uh, Cuba, of course, but it, you know, everyone in Cuba is quite eager to, to get things back on track. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the current the COVID situation and, and what's going on there. Um, a little bit later, but uh, as you saw in the video, and and Mark, let me know if I because I don't have feedback, so let me know if uh, for some reason I'm not my voice isn't on or I'm not projecting. Um, the there are three main synagogues in the Havana area, um, and basically um, there are 1,200. I would say it's approximately at this point Jews um, that 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 are members of these, one of these three synagogues. The largest congregation um, would be uh, Bet Shalom, often referred to as the Patronato. Um, and uh, it's a really, they have an interesting story. And, and when you travel there, uh, of course, you'll visit, we can visit all of, all of the temples, um, but without doubt, uh, Patronato is, always, is usually a highlight. Um, there's there's so many great stories that come out of it. it not only that, but but the um, the relationship between the Jewish community and Fidel Castro is an interesting one. As you all might might be aware, I mean, religion in general, communism, religion, you know, don't don't necessarily uh, go hand in hand. And it certainly was discouraged, especially just after the revolution. It took a couple of decades before they started to allow a little more uh, religious practices. Otherwise it really went into hiding. Um, but uh, Fidel Castro, uh, and you'll hear this story told much better when you're actually in Cuba, but he uh, was invited to attend of all things, a, um, a Hanukkah celebration at Bet Shalom. And he, he heard the story of the Maccabees. And to him, that story, uh, was, you know, a, a complete, basically reminded him of his revolution. And from then on, he, he had a, a much different uh, feel and um, affinity, so to speak, uh, for the Jewish population of Cuba and, 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 and always gave them a lot more leeway. Um, so it's just, a, it, it's an interesting thing. Um, so anyway, you will visit the three. There, there's one that is uh, obviously much more orthodox, Temple Adath. Uh, the Sephardic Temple actually has the only Holocaust Museum in Cuba, um, but they also run a senior center providing Jewish programming. So that's uh, that's often a, a really nice visit as well. Um, we certainly can attend services and and usually we'll do that. And in a trip that we certainly we plan for uh, your temple, um, we would make sure to be there on a Friday. Um, the services are, are more vibrant and interesting at the Patronato. Uh, it is the most reform of the three temples. Um, there is no active rabbi. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're short services. And then usually afterward, there is a dinner um, with, with lively conversation, often dancing. It's a, it's a really, really nice evening. Um, we, uh, we will definitely visit the old Jewish quarter in, in, of Old Havana. The Jewish cemetery is fascinating to see. There's a Jewish themed hotel in Old Havana called Hotel Raquel. Um, I, again, I won't go into a lot of detail about it, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting um, and was a project by Eusebio Leal, who is widely credited with the complete renovation. Um, he's not Jewish, uh, the complete renovation of, of Old Havana. And it was part of his idea to create this 
this uh, this Jewish themed hotel. Um, and lastly, of course, we will we plan to do some sort of meaningful Jewish service project. One thing could be a, a cleanup project in the old cemetery. Um, another one would be something that we participate in with the Jewish Senior Center. And um, personally, I would probably lean that way just because interaction for them, especially with the American Jewish community, would mean so much to them too that the give and take that would, would be much more memorable in my opinion than doing more of an agricultural cleanup job on the on the cemetery. Um, but now that we're talking about it, before I go into the, the, the other highlights in Cuba, um, I just want to touch on this idea of support for the Cuban people a little bit more. Um, you may be aware there are quote unquote like they, well, the, the Trump administration remo removed a couple of them, but there are the way that you that Americans can travel legally to Cuba is by being under certain licenses. There are educational licenses, there are religious licenses as well, which is, was the story I told you right from the, from the outset. My very first trip to Cuba, which I thought was a humanitarian trip, ended up being under a Jewish license, interestingly enough. Um, but, and we could, of course, do a trip to Cuba with the synagogue, given that we are doing this much Jewish content and fall under that category. However, Support for the Cuban people has been the mission of our business from the get-go. It is something that regardless of whether this was a, a way to actually travel legally or not, we would be um, undergoing anyway. So this is, and it also gives, I, I feel, the most leeway in an itinerary. At its, at its core, the simplest way to explain it, from the US Treasury Department's explanation of what support for the Cuban people means, they want to ensure that the vast majority of money that any American citizen spends on travel to Cuba goes to the people of Cuba and not the government of Cuba, hence not actively supporting a communist regime. Um, so, okay, that in itself, I think a lot of us can get behind, it's great. Um, we take it to another level. For me, and I'm fortunate that I'm able to be in this position, our entire company's mission is support for the Cuban people. Everything beyond the expenses it takes for us to put these trips on goes back into support for the Cuban people in a variety of community projects that we support. Some that we entirely independently support that are fully, others that we're just a part of. Um, but it's such a part and parcel of everything that we do that in addition to the Jewish programming, um, we will invite all of you to participate a little bit in part of it, as part of your itinerary to see where, where that money is going. Um, one example, which is shown on this slide, uh, we, um, we have a preschool for disadvantaged youth in Old Havana. This is for children ages two to five. They come from difficult situations um, at home. They're not orphans. Uh, but, you know, they will, the situations usually are one of their parents is incarcerated uh, or uh, their mother is involved in prostitution. Um, there, are ver there are various reasons that they won't have anyone properly to care for them during the day. And therefore, they come free of charge to our preschool. And we operate it like a Head Start program. So in addition to two nutritious meals a day, they receive... Um, you know, arts and crafts projects, they, um, and as, and a like Head Start reading program. So most of them, by the time they transfer into, into kindergarten, which is then provided by the Cuban government, um, they are already reading. But I'll tell you, um, it, it's, it's in Old Havana. It's very easy for us to arrange. And we, and for the, for the most part, it's becomes one of the highlights of our, um, of our tours. Uh, you, you can, we will have you all come in. You'll meet, you'll meet the kids, maybe do some song and dance and read some stories to them. It's a joy for them and a joy for the people that get to experience it. A um, couple other things. Uh, we also fully support a dance company in Cuba and I'll talk more about them, I think later. Um, another thing that we encourage, again, aside from just seeing the, the sites, and of course, you're gonna have this amazing guide who is with you all the time and is very interesting. But we want to, we want you, you to have the experience of interacting with other members of the, of the uh, Cuban society, 
uh, from different walks of life. Um, one of them, for example, the, uh, a good friend of mine now is, a, is one of the top cultural and press attaches. He, he's a diplomat who you know, started out as a history professor at the University of Havana. Um, he's a fascinating individual and somebody that we would usually invite maybe to join us for a lunch or a dinner. Uh, and, and this is someone who, yes, is an active member of the current regime and has been. Um, but it's, it's a chance for you to talk to someone like that. It's a very rare opportunity. And because he's been working with us so long, he's quite open, quite open to different perspectives, quite open to giving you a side of things that, you know, you're only hearing one side of uh, what's been going on for the last 60 years and the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. And this is somebody that can really, really enlighten you. And one quick tidbit on him, which I think uh, often amazes people, um, he is a homosexual. He is out of the closet. Not only that, he is married um, and still very respected, active member of the government. Cuba, unlike many other communist countries, extremely open and very liberal when it comes to LGBTQ rights. So um, again, it's something that most people are very unaware of when it comes to Cuba. Uh, the other one, the lead city, city planner, chief architect for the city of Havana, this guy's quite famous at this point. Um, he, he's someone that uh, some of you may have already uh, seen because on CNN and Anthony Bourdain and other things, he's often sought after for, for um, US TV appearances and appears on the news. He's uh, one of the key architects behind the, the, the renovation of Old Havana. And he will come and do this incredible presentation for us um, all about how they, how they embarked on that project. And then what, what's going on with the rest of, of Havana and you know, how can this government that is so poor, third world country, uh, you know, continue to do this project because what you will see when you get to Cuba, it is a absolutely gorgeous city, but it looks like a bomb went off in the middle of it um, because of the years of ruin. And there are literally buildings collapsing every single day. The dance company I talked about uh, previously, um, we are the proud uh, sponsors of this dance company, which started literally in a, a you know, the, their, their headquarter um, workshop and studio is in a section of Havana that most tourists would not go to. It's called Maria Now. Um, and that's another thing that's really important when you take a trip anywhere is to, to, again, when I talk about off the beaten path, it's such an often, you know, overused kind of phrase. Um, but the idea is, it's important to see old Havana, to be in the walking streets, uh, to go to some of the most beautiful buildings and see the highlights. Um, but then you also want to see where are the people really living and how are they living? Um, and so this is a, is a great excuse to go into this neighborhood of Marianao, um, a very poor neighborhood. And Havana Compass Dance was, was started by a classically trained choreographer and a, an artist and a bata drummer. And the two of them decided to create a uniquely kind of Cuban style of dance, which fused Latin dance, traditional Latin dance um, with Afro-Cuban rhythm. And by doing so, all of the dancers learn percussion. So you can just see it here and I'm, I, I, it, just, from, just from the photographs, but I'm telling you, it is, it's, it's just a sight to behold. It's so highly energetic. Uh, and you know they're so talented. They're both talented dancers and now talented drummers. And it's something that it's very hard to, to imagine until you actually see it. Um, but the point is we, we will actually go and visit their, you know, their home studio and, and learn the whole story of how they were founded and how they came together. Um, one thing we're really proud of because when I discovered them you know, seven years ago, they weren't that well known, um, struggling to kind of get noticed and uh, obviously didn't, uh, didn't have economically, they were very challenged to get off the ground. And now flash forward to today, um, pre-COVID, and we, um, we have had them touring uh, internationally and they even made, managed to, to make it to the US. Uh, this was pre-Trump administration, which then shut all of those things down. We couldn't get them visas anymore, um, but we're excited to get them back to, to more international travel. Um, we will visit private art studios. The other unique thing about art, art is really having its day, Cuban art, and, and some of you are art collectors already know this. 
um, uh, something unique about Cuban art. It's not gallery focused. So when you are in Cuba looking uh, to, to learn more about art, you will literally go visit the individual artists in their home studios, meet them, talk about the art, and then of course you can purchase them. But that that is how it works within Cuba. Uh, of course, no visit to Cuba is uh, complete without a walking tour of the main plazas in Old Havana. And again, no need for me to go into too much detail about it. It is absolutely fascinating what they've done. You will see the juxtaposition of the stuff that they have already renovated. Um, and it's just, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it's something that, that strikes people. They, they didn't realize the varied architecture that exists within this, this amazing city. Um, and what I mentioned before, Sebio Leal, he's the one behind it. And also the architect that you'll be able to have a presentation with. Um, and the way they painstakingly renovated um, these, these structures. And they have a lot more to do, of course, but it's always interesting to be able to see the renovated with, with the non renovated So I was talking about walking tour of Old Havana. Um, now you see what I was referring to. We'll move on from there. Um, of course, no trip to Cuba is, is complete without riding in classic 1950s cars. Um, we have a wonderful photographer um, on our team who will help capture this moment uh, with a chase vehicle. Um, and, and let me tell you, you hear this a lot. Um, of course, it's, it's, you know, it's always one of the highlights of a, of a visit to Cuba. And you know what? It, for good reason. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's important. Not many people get to do this. These cars are really part of the society. I mean, obviously, we have some very beautiful renovated vehicles. Um, but you will see these classic American cars, uh, you know, held together with duct tape and rubber bands everywhere. Not just the gorgeous ones that are mainly used, you know, to drive tourists around. But it's, the, it's one of the first things you'll notice once you uh, once you leave the airport in Havana. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, you can't have a trip without without at least having this experience. And so we usually try to do this right at uh, at sunset and drive down the beautiful Malacón, which is what you're seeing in that bottom right right corner photograph there and it's uh, it it's uh, it's even more fun to be honest when you've got a large group so depending on how many people go on this trip um you know have, having everyone you know three four people in a car and a, a parade of these cars going down the malecon it's it's really a nice nice experience um for the hemingway fans out there um you know it's uh, it's an important destination to to visit um, in fact, we, we do get often a lot of clients that that is their main focus. Um, the, one of the main key reasons they wanted to travel to, to Havana if they're, if they're really into Hemingway. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a must by any means, but depending on the, the interest among the congregation, it's always fascinating to go to uh, Finca uh, Vagia, which uh, is the estate that, that Hemingway lived in for so many years. It's where he wrote Old Man on the Sea. Um, arguably the house that he spent more time in and, and loved more um, than the one that you might be familiar with in Key West. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, he left Cuba uh, shortly before he committed suicide. The Cuban government took over the Finca, left everything as it was. Um, so you'll see his writings on the wall when you, when you look in the different rooms, um, he was obsessed with his weight and he would weigh himself every day and scribble on, on one of the walls in the bathroom. And you can see it very clearly, the books, the art, um, everything is still there. His, his, uh, his famous fishing boat, uh, the Pilar also there. Um, I encourage you before any trip to Cuba also, especially if you're into Hemingway, there's a really good, there's been a lot of documentaries about Hemingway, but there's a new one. Um, that just came out on PBS, a new Ken Burns documentary. It's just absolutely fantastic. And then you will really, it, it focuses on his entire life, but you'll see at least two of the episodes um, take place in Cuba. Um, of course, in addition to that, no, no, no Hemingway tour is complete without a, a visit to a couple of his other famous haunts. I mean, aside from, aside from writing and fishing, the other thing that uh, Ernest Hemingway spent a tremendous amount of time doing was drinking. Um, so, uh, 
a visit to his two favorite bars. Um, one is one of the most famous uh, bars in, in probably in the world at this point. It's called El Floridita, and it is thought of as the, the home of the daiquiri, where the daiquiri was invented. There's actually a bust of Ernest Hemingway there in the exact spot on, uh, up at the bar where he used to sit. Um, and then the other one is called uh, Bodeguita, and Bodeguita is where the mojito was invented. And so there's a, there's a saying um, that Hemingway uh, said, and it was uh, written in some documents that they found after his death in his house. Um, you know, my, 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 uh, my daiquiris at Floridita, uh, my mojitos at Bodeguita. So um, it's fun to, to visit both of, both of those locations and they're nearby each other in, in Old Havana. Uh, there's also a very famous thing which you see on this uh, slide right now. Uh, artist Jose Fuster, who literally, he's a ceramic artist and he came up with this concept. He wanted to, um, he wanted to help improve the situation. He was, he was a, you know, a relatively unknown ceramic artist. His studio was in this town, this quaint fishing village, Jamanitas, and he wanted to give back to the community around him. So he came up with this idea that he should spread his art outside of his studio and attempt to basically ceramic tile with these colorful um, hand-drawn tiles, the entire village. He's not quite finished yet. The project is still going on, um, but he did it. He achieved what he set out to do because it has brought in busloads and busloads of tourists. It's on most everyone's highlight list if they have never been to Havana before. Um, so it's usually a, a nice you know, one hour stop and it's a little bit outside of Havana as well. So it's nice to get out. Um, we have tremendous relationships with a number of the mo of wonderful Cuban musicians. Um, and I can't say enough about the musical talent that exists in Cuba. So, uh, this is just one example. There's, there's others, but what we often like to do, especially when we get a nice group of people is bring in one of these groups. And these are Grammy award-winning musicians, um, to come in and put on a private concert, uh, for all of you. Um, and, and then, you know, these guys are interesting and they will stay around, um, have drinks with everybody, get into conversations about what, uh, you know, what the situation is for, for, for these Cuban musicians. Um, a visit to the Hotel Nacional, not a stay. I think we talked about that before I even got started. There were a few people on the call early and uh, it was brought up that someone I, I believe had been to Havana before and stayed at the Hotel Nacional. Um, the Nacional uh, resembles, if anyone has been to the Breakers, which I'm sure a lot of you have, it resembles the Breakers for one very good reason. As you can see, same exact uh, design firm created both. Um, a lot of history there. And for the Godfather fans, yes, that is where the famous scene was shot um, at the uh, Nacional. Um, not a great uh, hotel to stay in service wise and all of that, but I, it's one of my favorite places to, uh, to smoke a cigar in the outdoor patio overlooking the Malacan. So it's, um, it's a nice, nice place to visit and a highlight. Um, we also like to showcase some of the Cuban entrepreneurs and, and um, let everybody know a little bit about their story and what's going on. Dador is a great example of that. Um, it is Haute Couture. Um, she, she actually is a, a Cuban who had, temporarily lived in New York and uh, then came back uh, to start a, a design movement in Cuba, which is really, you know, didn't exist until very, very recently. I mean, hearing her story is, is always really interesting. Um, I also, uh, you know, have developed a lot of really amazing friendships during the course of these last 10 years. Um, and, and one of them is with Fidel Castro's son, Alex. Uh, you know, again, Politics aside, um, Alex is a photographer. He is someone who, um, you know, was certainly very close to his dad and, and certainly uh, mourned his loss, um, but is not a political uh, figure and was not, not, not involved with any of the governing or any of those kinds of decisions, even though he, he and his father were very close. Um, he wanted to be a professional baseball player. You may also know that baseball is, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest national pastimes as far as sports are concerned in Cuba, the other one being boxing. Um, but, uh, you know, he wasn't talented enough at that, but he discovered he had a talent for photography. So today he is the state photographer. He has a couple of really amazing books out, one called uh, My Papa Fidel, 
um, which has a lot of, you know, behind the scenes kind of photography, personal moments with his dad, and also a lot of the, you know, photos of, of the famous people that have, you know, he's come in contact with over the years as a state photographer. Um, when he's in town and when he's not uh, on, on a shoot, um, we love to have our guests uh, spend a little time with him. He's, a, he's sensitive. He doesn't want to talk politics, but it's a, it's a rare opportunity, you know, to meet uh, one, one of the Castros. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's good bragging rights because uh, I don't care how many of your friends have, have been to uh, into Cuba. I can assure you, unless they came with us, they probably didn't meet Alex. Um, I'm going to skip over El Moro Fort in the, in, in the Revolution Square, two really interesting historic locations, which, of course, we can put on, on the itinerary. Um, and jump to one of my favorite things, of course, which is rum tasting. And I told you a little bit about my, my history. Um, the, the opportunity that we provide is you will meet again, another friend of mine, he's the director of Havana Club. We will take you into the private tasting room, which is not open to the public. Um, and you'll get the opportunity to learn more about what makes this rum so special. And, and also taste some rums that aren't actually even marketed, you know, rums that are 50 years old and older. Um, you can even smoke a cigar because unlike other places in, uh, in the world, of course, in Cuba, there's not too many places even indoors that you're, you're not, uh, in, not only is it okay to smoke a cigar, you're, you're encouraged to do so. Um, we will also visit, of course, one of the oldest cigar factories in the world, um, the home of the Cohiba, Romeo and Julieta, um, you've got to hear the story literally from seed to stick on how these cigars are created. Um, it gives you a whole new appreciation, especially when you're holding on to a cigar uh, that, you know, can can cost at market, you know, twenty five dollars and up for one stick. It gives you a, a real appreciation for what went into that um, and, and why Cuban cigars are so much better than everything else in the world. Already talked about Floridita. Um, David, yes, I just want to make sure we have time for questions. So we're, oh, we're, we're almost all right. We, we've, uh, with the technical difficulty, I think we've run, uh, we've run over. So let's, let's skip to that because, um, there's one more video that's, that's, that's definitely, uh, interesting to see, but it's, uh, probably runs about three minutes long. Um, so if we want, if some people want to stick around longer, I can always play it. But the, the thing I just want to quickly touch on before we go to Q and a is the food. Um, I hear this all the time. People say, you know, well, I know you don't go to Cuba or Havana for the food. Nothing could be further from the truth anymore. Um, they, the, there's a uniquely Cuban invention called the paladar. Paladar started out as a private table in someone's home. And it's now evolved over the years. It still technically is a restaurant in someone's home. The people that own it, it's not owned by the government. The government has no involvement in these paladares. Um, they are still part of people's homes. They would either convert the ground floor or, uh, you know, a room next to their home and the people live there or live up, live up above. And this is where the very best of Cuban food is served today. Um, some of them are so small, there's just a few tables. Um, the biggest of them might have 50 tables, but that's as big as they can possibly get. Um, and again, privately run, privately owned the quality of the food, the, the, the creativity, it is absolutely amazing. The only thing that limits them is the ingredients. But the thing about that is that's also why the silver lining, they are primarily 100% organic. In order to be a top polydar, you have to have a relationship with an organic farm that literally every day brings you fresh produce, a butcher that brings you your meat, and a local fisherman is bringing you his fresh caught fish. So the menus change every single day and every single meal that you go to will be in a different paladar. It's part of the adventure of a trip to Cuba and, and one of the highlights for sure. Um, so I'll skip over the, the video so that we can get to Q&A. And uh, during the Q&A, we can talk a little bit, bit more about, about the nightlife because that's also uh, a key, key focus. So uh, one last thing. Um, just to give you quick bullet point um, highlights, and this is still a work in progress, um, but the current plan is hopefully to do a very special custom trip for all of you um, in, uh, if, we can, if we can do it in early part of maybe even the last, last couple of weeks of January, 2022. 
Um, we're looking at a four night, five day trip, maybe five nights, six days, um, depending on everyone's desires. Obviously, it will involve everything that we talked about so far in this presentation. Um, a Jewish focus, of course, but you know, then so much more on, on the rest of the rest of the itinerary. Um, every single thing will be catered to you and included. And there you have it. So I'm. So um, oh, first of all, I want to thank David for the presentation and um, his uh, insight into Cuba, the Jewish Cuba and the sites of Cuba and his passion for the country is clear for the island is clear. A um, couple of things before we start Q&A. Um, one is um, this is something that is absolutely in the infancy stages and it still has to uh, have board approval. Um, and we have not even gotten that far yet, but we wanted at least people to know that it was something that we were thinking about. Um, we've had a lot of people come up and ask us about it. So it is something that we're hoping to do, but we're waiting. And now that we've had the information, we're going to get an itinerary together and we'll get it to the board for their approval. I'm, uh, I think it froze. I froze again, Mark, but I'm back now. Okay. I turned off the, so turned off the screen share. As soon as we get uh, board approval, you'll all hear about it and then we will um, we'll go on from there, but the plan is towards the end of January of 22, so it doesn't converge with any other major synagogue things that we've got going on. Um, we will um, just remind everybody, Al asked me to remind you about uh, some programming coming up. There's some new things coming up with um, on the 10th, uh, Jewish Uganda, the 12th, Middle East in Crisis with Dr. Stephen Burke. Um, we have a Shavuot service on May 17th in person. You need to sign up. Um, brief history of anti-Semitism with our new rabbi, Stuart Altschiller, on May 20th. And another look at Kashrut with Rabbi Altschiller on the 27th. So check the synagogue website and the weekly email for that. Um, also, Thursday night, we will have an overview of the trip to Europe. If you're interested at all in going to Europe with the synagogue next year, that will be Thursday evening. Rabbi Altshuler and I will be answering questions about that. Um, the questions that we've gotten so far, um, the first question was, and if you have questions, please put them in the box. How has Cuba changed since the Castros, at least since Fidel is gone? Raul's still kind of around. Um, how has Cuba changed, David? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. And, and what's, I think one of the things that uh, is interesting is a lot of people would say that, that it has literally been frozen in time. So, um, you know, a, a lot hasn't changed. And that's one of the first things that hits you when you're, when you're there. Um, but now you have this new generation um, that really doesn't remember the Castros. Um, they, especially Fidel. So it, it's, it's a long, long time since you know, Fidel Castro was standing in Revolution Square delivering his famous you know, six, seven hour you know, long speeches and everybody had to kind of stand in there and listen to him. You know, the, the, the youth of Cuba, which are no longer youth, they're young adults. Um, they, um, they, don't, uh, you know, they, don't, they don't have much recollection of this at all. And Raul was a very different leader. So he implemented reforms that were not really uh, taking place under Fidel, which, is, which has enabled the Paladar that I was talking about, the culinary, um, an, a certain amount of small businesses to, to, to evolve. And apparently they're gonna continue that. So I think those are the biggest changes. Um, and the other one would, would be the internet. You know, for us, we were already at this stage that we've taken it for granted. When I first started doing business in, in Cuba, the average Cuban did not have access to the internet at all. In fact, it was really just in the last few years that now it's become something where almost everyone in the population, especially in the Vanna area, has access to. So like anything, that is, is creating a, a tremendous amount of change as well. Um, and as you might know, Raul has now stepped down or he's about to. Um, so there's a lot of talk about what, what, what will happen next. Where, where will the regime head from this point? Um, um, I also want to just say, um, I, I also have been to Cuba twice. I, I did a trip um, for a week uh, several years back, and then I did another trip um, for a shorter trip, which was a little more focused on the Jewish side of Cuba in 2018. 
And I, I have to say, if you notice the cemetery in the video that David showed, when Roz and I visited that cemetery in, in November of 2018, I was um, probably never more shaken about anything that I had seen than when I walked into that cemetery. It was abhorrent. It was an awful condition. And there were people working there to try to bring it back. And then the, so the pictures that I saw in the video today were a, 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 a like leaps and bounds ahead of where the cemetery was just three short years ago. So, um, and that and that's sort of to the point where David talked about how the city is this beautiful, beautiful city and you walk around a walking tour and you just walk among rubble. There's just concrete slabs that are just sitting in the street waiting to be taken away so that they can regenerate these buildings and make, make the city um, really um, livable again. So it's definitely a sight to behold. Um, we, we had some great, um, we had some great visits uh, to the, um, to Hemingway's house was wonderful, but we visited the three synagogues. Um, it was, it was a great thing. Um, it's interesting that the tour guides are so knowledgeable about Jewish stuff. And as David indicated, I don't think any of them are Jewish. I don't think there's a Jewish tour guide um, in, in Havana, but they all really forget whether they could speak Yiddish or not, but they, um, but they can absolutely, um, they have the history and it's very, very interesting. Um, we were in one of the synagogues and it was, I think it was an early Friday morning and there was a splatter of blood in the, in the lobby. And the shochet had just come through having prepared the meat, getting ready for Shabbos and there was, there was blood. And we saw that and, and then we were explained that that had just happened and, and that was, so it was very, very interesting from a Jewish perspective. Um, at the time, the Patronato was not accepting new medications because they had enough. My guess is with COVID, they're back to wanting some stuff again so we can bring some things if we go. And they're very, very um, uh, appreciative of anything that Americans can bring to them. Yeah. Uh, especially what, we, what we do in that regard is, because um, it changes all the time. So, you know, we have obviously, uh, I personally am there about a week out of every month, but, it, you know, my team will let me know before we have any, you know, every month kind of the list changes. And we send this out to anyone who's participating or going on a trip with us to Cuba and we send them out some things that will be really highly sought after and needed for everyone to kind of bring with them. Um, um, no, Karen um, and Gerard, uh, we are not planning visits at, uh, to Cienfuegos or other cities. The, the trip will be uh, only if it is four nights and five days. So there won't be really time to get beyond Havana on this particular plan. So unfortunately not. I think I think we we were looking at maybe a five night trip. Actually, that that slide showed four nights, but I think I think we're looking at a five night trip. But um, just to just to, to let you know, the thing about anything going outside, if you're if if it's it's about a four and a half drive hour drive to Cienfuegos in Trinidad, um, and there are no longer any flights back and forth to the U.S. except from to and from Havana. So you take that drive, you also have to come back again. Um, while it's a very interesting place to go, we would have to add on a minimum of two more nights to make to add on to to make the Cienfuegos Trinidad trip. Um, so I think as far as the overall group is concerned, the best way to approach that is it can be an add on for some of some of those who want to do that. Um, but for for the for most of the of the group, I think it'll be, you know, get a lot out of just a, that five night trip and not have to make that drive back and forth. Uh, any other questions that anybody has that they want to put in the box? You can also, uh, I don't know if you want to, you can unmute. I know we've ran way over and I apologize for that. I don't usually have uh, technical difficulties like this. So I'm not sure what was going on there, but um, for anyone who wants to stay on, you can unmute yourselves and ask me questions directly as well. I'm happy um, with, fine with that. So the, 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 the question about price, we're not there yet. I can't really give you a, an answer. Um, until we finalize an itinerary and we get approval from the board. So I unfortunately I can't answer that question right now. Anybody else? 
All right, I want to say thank you all very much for uh, coming tonight and to David for his presentation and his insight into Cuba. It was wonderful to uh, go back there again, if only virtually. And um, we will look forward uh, to seeing you all on the future programming. And uh, again, if you're interested in Europe trip Thursday night, all the details uh, at this uh, back channel. So thank you all very much. Have a great night and uh, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Great meeting you virtually. Appreciate you, you being here. Thank you, David.